So hello, um, welcome to this special webinar on connecting science and art, how to um, find and be a science artist. Um, my name is Simon Clark. I'm the European Geosciences Union's Projects Coordination Officer. And today we have two speakers to talk on and discuss the experience in arts and sciences. We have Larissa Bandelon, a PhD student, Anglishologist, um, who is also an artist aiming to communicate climate scientists, among other things, through art. And uh, Natalia Jagielska, a doctoral student at the University of Edinburgh, who specializes in paleontology, but focused on the evolution of Jurassic pterosaurs, and also arts ranges from illustration books to creating accessible science. So both uh, will speak on their experiences first, and then there'll be questions towards the end. If you have any questions, please put them in the box uh, and we'll get around to them. Uh, and so to begin with, uh, Natalia, could you bring in your discussion yeah. or presentation? Loading the presentation up. Hi guys, my name is Natalia and as introduced, I have a, I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and I study paleontology, which is study of extinct animals, most of which which are no longer alive and probably will never see them uh, in flesh unless some kind of Jurassic Park event happens, which is pretty unlikely. Uh, but it's something that already happened in the past. Uh, uh, people were talking about animals they never had seen previously. Uh, and I, on the opening slide, I have some examples of this very phenomenon. Uh, so you have the Juris rhino from uh, 1515, so almost 500 years ago. That was uh, illustrated by a German printmaker 500 years ago uh, in Europe before we had any rhinoceroses. There were just uh, mentions of them in literature and there were plans of importing one to Europe via Mediterranean, but suddenly it died and drowned in a storm. So nobody had seen rhinoceros in Europe. Uh, Giro wanted to expose this animal to the European community, so he uh, communicated with some people uh, to get description and got some sketches uh, from people that seen those rhinos and tried to reconstruct the animal as he, would, he thought it's going to be looking alive. And as you can see in this corner over here, that's the rhino he came up with. It's, it's, it looks like a small tank, it looks like a very big armadillo. Uh, it's very, it has this very night uh, like uh, look with uh, armor of small bumps and it's just chain link protected uh, feet, which are not really, I think you see in uh, uh, Rhino, but that was what was he reflected in the descriptions he received. So it's not accurate for the description of animal, but it's an interesting interpretation of how the animal looked like from secondary sources. Uh, and that illustration was featured in uh, 1551 uh, Historia Animalium, which was one of the first of illustrated encyclopedias for general public with uh, illustrations of animals. And it included a rhino, a rhino and also included things like unicorns and fantasy animals. Not because people thought they were real, just because they were boosting the sales of the book. <laughs> so that's the uh, cool story of the first encyclopedia. And you can also see that the exopus that was featured in an uh, encyclopedia was also drawn out of not from living an animal because living octopi usually have slants for eyes. This one has a big round eyes. This is possibly also illustrated by use communication. And the OVF uh, mammoth, it's one of the first reconstructions of mammoths uh, with soft tissue based on some tusks found in Siberia. And as you can see, it doesn't look very elephantine. And as a paleontologist, we are basically doing what those artists are doing 500 years ago. We are trying to reconstruct animals from bits and bobs, from comments, from sketches that nature left us behind. Before I get into it, quick introduction about me. Uh, my name is Antal Jelska. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh in my last year, unfortunately, scary times. And I'm a paleontologist and I study Jurassic pterosaurs. So basically those guys, big flying reptiles with enormous wings. I'm going to talk about them later. Uh, and in addition to my research, I make illustrations for academic publications, my own and of other scientists, use it for science communication. Uh, also, I draw as a, uh, relaxa for relaxa relaxation and self-expression, and also uh, earning some passive income from site, uh, time to time, which is great because I'm a minimum wage worker, so it doesn't hurt to have slightly more money. So let's start with science and art and how they intersected and how wh and why people might think them as a weird thing that doesn't really go in together. Uh, after all, uh, science and arts, usually we see creativity as something separate to intelligence, but that's not really the case at all when you look historically. Because people from since the start of the time, as soon as we could put uh, charcoal on a surface, we're illustrating and observing things and trying to contextualize things. Uh, uh, illustration helps us to uh, process and interpret things we see in real life 
and also in things like geosciences. It's a way of collecting, reproducing and preserving data, uh, even uh, especially before of video and digital media and like cameras. So if you wanted to capture something like a comet, an eruption, a fossil dust in situ or a rock formation, only way of collecting that data and uh, communicating to other scientists abroad was via illustration and art. And also, it's a learning tool. Uh, we still teach young geology undergrads to draw things they're seeing, to do uh, field sketches of uh, work formations. Uh, because when you start to focus on something, even not as a professional artist, and you have to reproduce it on a paper, you start uh, uh, making uh, notes of difference in texture, minute differences in color, and appreciating the thing in more detail than just surface level. So art in itself is a great way of learning new things and observing and recording. And it was in the past and still should be today, even with digital media. And observations come in different shapes and sizes. Also, uh, they're usually reflective of the time uh, they happened in. So when you look at something like comets, uh, there were records and illustrations of them dating to 3rd century BC in uh, things like uh, old silk manuscripts from China. You also see uh, mentions of the Halley's Comet in the Beige Tapestry from 1066. You can see it in the corner over here. It's not a scientific drawing, but reflects scientific phenomena people didn't know. Sometimes scientific phenomena can be also used to contextualize why the things happening uh, on, uh, in the current time, sort of contextualizing outside of the uh, scientific field, like this 1853 comet representing things that happened in the past year. And in slightly more uh, 20th century twist, uh, we are slightly moving away from the illustration with photography. Uh, and a cool story about uh, Haley Comet coming back in 1910 to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, contextualize sciences. When the comet was going back through the United States, people were worried that it's going to cause end of the world, that it's going to release cyanide gas and life, life on Earth. And people kept, and uh, there was a lot of fake news and pseudoscience in the news. So very uh, contemporary stuff, people selling uh, anti-comet umbrellas and uh, medications like uh, Dr. Halley's Comet Fever Peels. So <laughs> that's kind of exciting. Uh, and this sort of showcases how we looked at the same phenomenon of comet throughout time with art and how we look at art and how we uh, uh, deliver art. Uh, and with something like paleontology, it's super important because it also helps us to visualize our speculation and reflect the society that we live in. So uh, I'm going to focus on a small example of an iguanodon, which is a, a herbivorous dinosaur from the Cretaceous. And that it was this, uh, the, this guy was illustrated by Mantle, who discovered a lot of iguanodon pieces. Uh, and he created this uh, quadrupedal lizard-like animal, iguana-like animal with a small horn on its nose. Uh, this idea was sort of carried forward to the Crystal Palace exhibition, which was the first exhibition uh, presenting dinosaurs to the general public, uh, run by the guy who opened National History Museum in London. And it also presented dinosaurs as this kind of extinct, loom-bearing things. Things you look at, it's like, oh, I understand why this thing went exist, uh, extinct. Uh, and sort of maybe even reflected uh, old colonial old world views. And it still went for the colonial, not colonial, quadrupedal uh, the reconstruction of the animal with the horn on its nose. In 20th century, with more uh, discoveries uh, and more animals uh, and more better understanding of animal biology, we started thinking about dinosaurs as slightly more active animals, uh, slightly more endothermic. Uh, and here we have reconstruction of Iguanodon, but the horn that was on the nose moved on the thumb. Uh, and uh, with the here is the most modern interpretation of the animal by a contemporary paleo artist, uh, just combining different uh, perspectives together. We know slightly more about musculature. We have better communication between zoologists and paleontologists. We have more fossil specimens of better quality, which sometimes preserve soft tissue formation. And we have slightly different interpretation of that animal. That doesn't mean that's the final version and, uh, of the thing, but there's still a lot of things to learn. And this image will be defined and recontextualized uh, with changes of culture and also changes in our scientific understanding. So in paleontology, art is a great way of seeing how uh, society perceives animals, how science was communicated and why, uh, and how views and uh, no, uh, amount of information happens and like dinosaur changed over time. Uh, and sometimes even this source kind of speculation can be prophetic. Uh, so in uh, 1915, uh, uh, William Beebe, uh, uh, sort of uh, propose this kind of animal, a uh, uh, bird uh, lizard mixture that's uh, like a small uh, biplane with wings on its arms and legs, uh, stretching with feathers. And uh, almost 100 years later, uh, this very similar animal sort of uncovered 
from China, a, a quadrupedal uh, flying microraptor. So sometimes even a uh, speculation of an art can turn into a real discovery in the future. Uh, also interestingly, sometimes artists and scientists can come together to create brand new discoveries, like in this Winfair paper from 2016. We always keep telling uh, to people, or used to tell people, that we'll never know for sure how dinosaurs could have looked like, and all the things we are doing, it's a, a sort of evidence-backed interpretation and reconstruction, which is not always accurate, but it's the best we can do. Uh, but with uh, amazing fossils coming to light and new uh, methodologies of studying them, we could reconstruct this uh, Psittacosaurus, a small ceratopsid. And you have a small model of this animal in this presentation by uh, Bob Nichols, a famous paleoartist, uh, who looked at the model, uh, at the fossil, uh, and had the amazingly soft uh, preserved soft tissue. You can see visual scales, you can see the extent of the musculature, you can see the bristles on its tail, and even small dots and discolorations on the skin, making for amazing reconstruction. So Bob Nichols did uh, this uh, 3D model of the animal, uh, just putting the things we see on the fossil on the model, and that model was used to study counter shading and camouflage within the animal. So sometimes you can combine artistry with science to create something brand new and novel. Uh, so uh, science and arts are definitely not something separate. In some of paleontology, especially, they uh, communicate with each other and co-evolve together. They complementary. And of course, science is very important. Uh, art is very important for communication, especially outside of fields, uh, outside of academic spectrum. Sure, we have the uh, models and other things which will be used as uh, tools for future scientists, uh, but uh, museum displays and even pop culture, film and TV is very important for science communication. Although art usually in uh, pop culture is being under control, something like Jurassic Park did more favors to paleontology than years of study itself, and something like uh, Day After Tomorrow as a film in, uh, influenced how many people look at climate change outside of academic spheres. So science communication via art is extremely important, and we should not be neglecting it. So with that, now knowing how important art and science is, how inter the intertwined they are, uh, how would, do you become an artist and scientist simultaneously? Or if, or if you are a scientist, how do you reach out to illustrators to help you boost your artwork? So to be an uh, artist and scientist, you have to be like a creature after an extinction event. You have to find your niche. Uh, and there are different niches within arts itself, and there are a lot of demands uh, that are created by the field. So you can be a technical artist, you can do diagrams, figures, and academic reference materials for textbooks and or complementary uh, materials for papers in journals. Uh, this will make your work stand out, make it more readable, uh, and uh, be useful, especially for other peers within your academic sphere. Uh, it can be also used to boost your research. You can create nice press release images that will get you clicks and get you talking, uh, get uh, uh, media outside of academic spheres interested in your research. You can also make accessible science communication and publish out public outreach illustrations that will capture imagination of people outside of academia, which is our goal as scientists. Or you can do it as something to relax, as a side hobby, uh, something to get your mind out of things, and also turn it into passive income. So I'm, um, I, as an artist, do uh, both of the things. So that here's a cover I did for my current biology paper. Uh, and uh, to communicate my science, I collaborate with other uh, artists, like Rebecca Groom of Paleo Plushies, to create interactive, movable plushies uh, that I can use and tour different schools and conferences and universities to help general public and other scientists on, to understand my research easily without intimidation and incorporate artists and local artists into my scientific communication process. And I also uh, like to beautify my research by creating cute stickers and posters which I can sell on conferences within and outside the academic spectrum, uh, which is also very useful. So if you want to make another artist, the first thing is to establish yourself. There's a lot of people, uh, but people have to find you if they you want to uh, stand out. So the best thing is to uh, open some stalls or conferences. So if you're doing uh, an academic conference, ask if you can have a small stall with samples of your work uh, and remember to have business cards ready. So each time you see a potential customer, you just give them a business card uh, and probably be in uh, conscious of them if they're going to be looking for an artist uh, to post their research or do science communication. You also have to be an, a, a very active on social media, which is the big and weird scary step. Because social media is very viable, it's very, very algorithm driven, driven, and it's very demanding. Uh, there are different uh, facets and different audiences in different uh, 
social media sites. So sometimes if you want to reach for uh, younger audiences, you might go for Instagram or uh, TikTok. If you want to reach all the audiences, you might try Facebook groups. Uh, it also varies on, depending on geography and it's quite unstable, as you can tell from Twitter, which sort of goes in and out of existence occasionally and might migrate to Mastodon. But active social media is important to just update people about your status and to present your artwork. It's also very important to have a portfolio ready, so each time somebody wants to commission you or do something, you have examples of your work ready, and also on website or shop to sell products uh, or advertise yourself, so you uh, have some email information, optimize it so it's easy to find on Google. It's also very important to network. Usually other artists know each other, so sometimes if you know no, uh, no one, you can find opportunities and help by network of other artists because we communicate with each other and like to learn about things. What few things to consider before you uh, go on to that adventure? Oh no. Uh, uh, is that uh, because it's, we are in EGU, it's a European conference. Every country in Europe has slightly different laws regarding uh, copyright, regarding copyright of artworks, and regulation regarding taxable income. So before you jump headfirst into selling your art or becoming a big time illustrator, uh, just uh, look at the uh, rights that are uh, happening in your country, uh, if it's easy for you to have side income without paying a lot of taxes for it, and if you can easily sell your art without, without worrying about gaining, gaining copyright for it. If you want to uh, get commissions, remember communication is very important. Uh, remember to show your works in progress to your customers uh, and not start working uh, without setting everything with your customer first. So set the price, expectations, and time span. Also, always remember you're a full-time academic, uh, so doing side uh, work as an artist might be additional workload because art is a full-time work. Remember to uh, know what you can do in what kind of time and how to juggle those kind of responsibilities responsibly. And that's everything for me. I uh, hope we have some questions for uh, uh, the Q&A later. Feel free to follow me on my social media to see some of my runs and artworks of cute dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And I think we'll be going to Larissa talking about very slightly more inorganic things. <laughs> okay, I hope it's all right. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Natalia. Um, before I move on to questions and discussion, uh, we'll move on to our second speaker, who is Larissa, if you'd like to. Again. Uh, thank you very much for being here and especially thank you Natalia for an incredible presentation and wonderful introduction to science and art and how they intertwine. Um, I'm Larissa and I'll be talking to you about illustrating climate science and illustrating and climate science, um, which is the perfect explanation of what I do. So just about me. Uh, Larissa, I'm a Dutch, German, and I'm currently a glaciologist at the University of Hanover uh, for another month because I hope to hand in my PhD thesis in a month. The topic of that is large-scale glacial modeling. Um, I had a start in climate science, sorry, that is my cat. I had a start in climate science um, and then moved on to glaciers because I've always been fascinated by everything ice and snow. And I will return more to climate science specifically uh, with my postdoc, which I will start in April uh, at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Besides being a scientist, I am also an artist. I do not have any professional training. I'm just uh, someone who, since she was a kid, always felt more comfortable with a brush in her hand. I mainly work in watercolor, but also when I have the space and time uh, on a larger scale in oil paints. And I'm trying to balance my work between sort of what may be considered more traditional art work that you might want to uh, hang up and um, has as have as a purely pleasing aesthetically pleasing piece and uh, illustrations that really tell a story. So this is some of um, just a few examples of the artwork that I do um, when I'm not looking at illustrating a certain topic. Then, uh, as Natalia also explained art can be an incredible side income, especially as a PhD student. And so I do a lot of work, um, like you can see here, this is work uh, for birth cards, for wedding invitations. Uh, and these are just commissions from people who indeed 
usually find me via social media. So that was a great tip from Natalia just before. And um, rather than um, diving into the history of art and science communication, um, which Natalia did wonderfully, I want to talk a little bit to you about why I think that art uh, can be an incredibly powerful tool for communication. Because raw, raw science communication, as it is often done by academics, um, can really spark a lot of negative emotions. Um, as scientists, it is difficult for us to imagine the level of understanding that the public has. And sometimes we uh, either assume knowledge that isn't there, or um, we tend to uh, feel that we don't want to dumb things down, or we want to subconsciously or not impress the public by sounding smart and in the end only confusing people. Finally, especially also, Speaking about climate uh, change, which just is a very broad topic, but it's also one that is goes hand in hand with a lot of very negative emotions. So the science communication about it can really start uh, can really spark fear in the public, which then leads to an urge to ignore it because we call it uh, in Dutch uh, putting your head into the sand or um, and I think it's actually the same in English. Uh, and it's really a very human uh, instinct to ignore something that you feel you cannot change and that might negatively impact your life. Also, because it is such a huge thing, uh, science communication of um, especially climate change topics can really lead to either feelings of inadequacy or a very stubborn resistance saying, okay, no, this, this isn't true, and these scientists, they don't know what they're talking about, which really leads to uh, these myths of, being, of climate change being a Chinese hoax, etc. So I realized that science communication is incredibly difficult, um, but I do believe that art can really prevent some of these negative issues that I just spoke about, because art can spark emotion and talking points. Uh, sometimes it's easier for the public uh, to look at a piece and um, maybe just think of it, oh, this is interesting, or oh, this looks pretty. It's easier to talk about a piece of art. It's easier to talk about an illustration rather than a block of text or data points. Also, art can really communicate at different levels because, uh, for example, the beautiful dinosaur illustrations that Natalia makes. You can put them in front of a variety of audiences and one can communicate about these pieces at very different levels. A child can just be interested in, oh, cool, that's a dinosaur. Um, look at the long tail, look at the spikes. Someone who is uh, maybe not entirely, not at all familiar with paleontology, but interested in it could say, oh, is that really what they used to look like? Oh, look at that uh, beak or look at that uh, skin that looks something like the bearded dragon that we have at home. And someone who might really already be an expert in paleontology uh, can look at the piece of art and say, oh, look at that detail. That is something I read about. Oh, that is sort of the new consensus of what this, what we now think this creature looks like, which is very different compared to 10 years ago. So this is very different than if you just put a paper about uh, the development of that dinosaur in front of people, that artwork can really uh, spark communication at different levels. And finally, from art, it, art can provide a segue into really deeper subject matter. By starting to look at a painting, um, you can discuss the painting and from then either talking to the person who made it and may know more about it, it may also um, just spark an interest and say, okay, I'm going to do a little Google search about this when I get home. Oh, I didn't know this. Or, hmm, let's find out about it. 
and or when your child starts asking questions uh going to the science museum with you looking at a piece of art and you maybe want to be able to answer those questions and find out the answers uh with them for yourself so i think that um those are some of the reasons that art can be incredibly powerful and incredibly effective uh, as a science communication tool. So I do some of that myself, and I'm going to just introduce a few projects to you that I work on. Uh, one of these projects is uh, illustrating journal articles, because journal articles, even though they are often referenced in uh, the science section of newspapers, in the news, but still they are often at a level that is difficult to comprehend for someone who is not trained as a scientist. However, often it is possible to distill the most important part of a journal article and either put it into one sentence or put it into a short presentation, which is what a lot of traditional science communicators do. But I also believe that it's possible to distill, uh, for many papers, it's possible to distill the most important message into a piece of art. So these are three examples that I did of papers. The one on the left, you see uh, the paper by Brzaghi et al, uh, Carbon Stocks in Central African Forests Enhanced by Elephant Disturbance. And it's a paper about how important elephants are uh, for the health of Afri Central African forests and how by their disturbance, they actually make sure that the forests can thrive because they tread down smaller plants so that light uh, actually gets to the larger plants and they are not suffocated. And that is what actually keeps a, uh, the forest alive. Uh, I've tried to, uh, in this illustration, show the difference uh, with the line of what can happen if we no longer have these elephants. And I think that this piece is just something that invokes emotion because you have the stark difference uh, of both sides. And I hope that it's also, besides maybe being a grim message, uh, it's also a piece that people do like to look at um, and say, okay, this is both something aesthetically pleasing and something that informs me. The same goes, I hope, for the other paintings. The second illustration is of a paper by uh, Peter Molnar and his team about uh, the fasting season length uh, um, for uh, polar bears. And it is a paper about the uh, fasting season length and how that connects to uh, sea ice cover and that as uh, sea ice coverage changes uh, in size and in, um, in time, uh, how long the sea ice cover lasts, uh, that affects food availability and so also fasting season length for polar bears. And thus, uh, because fasting, fasting season uh, really impacts the amount of uh, nutrition for polar bears, how they're able uh, to move their population forwards and have the little cute cubs that are on the polar bear mountains back. And then finally, we have uh, something that is very close to my heart and very close to my research. On the right side is an article by Vasti Weber, and it is how the Fenna Glacier in Austria changed over the years. And I think um, that is something that is, of course, often shown in photographs, but uh, with these, with painting, uh, it's just a really easy, immediate visual tool. Okay we have had a huge change over the years in the size of this glacier from 1899 to the present day. And it's just something you only look at the picture and you immediately see what's going on. So this is one of the projects that I do and I uh, have had very um, positive responses, especially also from the authors who use these images to promote their research, to promote their projects,
um, the elephant image has uh, been published in a uh, French magazine recently. Uh, so it's something that really gets this important research um, talked about, which I'm very honored to be a small part of. Next, um, one thing that is close to my heart, and I started doing this for the virtual EGU in 2021, is illustrating the science uh, scientists behind the science, because sometimes, especially in COVID times, it felt like science was something that was done from desks sequestered in homes um, and was very, could be very isolating. So this was a project really drawing scientists in, asking for volunteers who wanted to be painted, blended with their research. So we have uh, Harry Zekulari with uh, the Moderach uh, Glacier. Um, we have Dr. Beatrice Gersinos um, blended with her uh, calving icebergs and Dr. Amelie Kirchgesner who does incredible work on observing uh, meteorological and uh, ice processes on Antarctica. And it was a wonderful project because it allowed me to make these scientists a little more visible and to say, okay, this work is done by humans with passion who love doing what they do. And not only the science is important, but also the people behind it. And then finally, um, a small project, the last one I'd like to introduce to you uh, is the Illustrated Climate ABC. And it's a project to explain and visualize 26 of the most important terms around climate. So they're paintings and short explanations. And I hope to, at some point, publish them into a book, um, also collaborating with other scientists uh, and taking the very short explanations, so smaller blurbs, and have each expert scientist write one page, so a slightly longer, more in-depth explanation of the phenomenon so that again we have a book where communication happens at several levels. So uh, I'm just going to introduce a few of the letters to you. So we have A is for atmosphere, B is for biodiversity, C is for clouds, um, E is for entomology, H is for hysteresis, G is for glacier, I is for indigenous knowledge, and I've done a few more letters, but they haven't been digitized yet. Um, I'm still stuck on the letter K, and I'm very open to suggestions for letters. So uh, please, if you want to, put your suggestions in the question box as well. So what are the next steps for me personally that might also inspire you if you want to be a science artist or if you want to connect to a science artist? I'd love to finish the alphabet and uh, get the book rolling. And something that I would love to do is to create at some point a climate science and climate change interactive exhibit, because I think that um, having these interactive museum exhibits, Natalia also talked about them a little bit uh, more, can uh, just really inspire the younger generation. Of course, there's a whole bunch of other projects that are in my mind that I might want to do at some point, but for now I'm just incredibly grateful that I'm allowed to be a scientist and an artist, uh, that I'm allowed to uh, be a small part of other people's science journeys by communicating their research. So, um, and if you're one of the scientists who wants their research communicated and you think that one of my illustrations may be a good way to do it, please feel free to contact me. So thank you very much, Simon, for the invitation. And uh, we are looking forward to questions. Thank you both. Um, I think a good case has been made for why scientists and researchers should uh, collaborate with uh, artists and community in science. Um, but I just want to, as we start a discussion and the, the questions and answers from the audience, um, perhaps move towards the more material uh, baseline. Um, you said, Larissa, that um, scientists are driven by passion, so artists, of course, uh, which means 
both artists and scientists tend to be uh, often volunteer their labor or volunteer the products of the work. Um, but at some point, you've got to consider uh, the worth of your labor. Um, and there's gonna be a boundary where you need to start going, well, actually, if I'm putting all this work in, I've also got to live as well. Um, for artists, just becomes in the form of commissions. Um, so I suppose there's a two questions uh, around that topic is, as an artist, how do you gauge that worth? How do you set that boundary for saying, charging for commissions versus um, just offering up these kind of passions uh, for your art? And the second question flowing out is, perhaps more from the science side, is if you want to engage with artists and want to get their help and work, um, are there any do's and don'ts with working with artists or even approaching them for commissions? Um, that's an, an open question to think about both, but uh, if anyone wants to join it, jump in first. Hey, I guess for something like valuing your work, uh, it's coming to what kind of customer it is. So if it's for me, if it's a small NGO or a museum with a little funding and they want to have some science outreach or small school, that's completely free. It's like it's for betterment of the local community. I can spend uh, one hour and just give them something. They don't have to pay me. But if it's uh, somebody that has a big funding behind the research projects, if uh, it's a big private company, I will readily charge them uh, a fee they can afford or something that will just compensate for my time I'll be missing for my research. So it really depends on the customer, uh, what the kind of artwork requires it. Uh, and it might vary from person to person because we are academics, we are busy. Uh, it's sometimes hard to just take some time Time off or even work for weekends to do an illustration so it has to come from how busy we are and what kind of uh, outreach that work will uh, gift for us and we have other things like uh, illustration for my own research uh, i do covers for uh, journals i do uh, press release illustrations but they don't i don't get paid for them uh, because it's just something you do for free to make your research stand out but they can take a lot of time even like making uh, optional covers for a uh, publication that will take at least three days of your work and you'll never get paid for it it will promote a journal you publish to so it's a weird balancing act of, act of like do you want to spend a lot of time on this artwork that will, might benefit me it might not benefit me uh, or do i not and it it all depends on what kind of time you have and what do you want to get out of it. So yeah, I don't know what do, Laura said. What do you think about it? <laughs> I very much agree with you. I always look at the type of client and at my work, and in a way, I think I approach it uh, the same way I do review requests, um, because reviews also take up a whole lot of our time as a scientist, but they are for the betterment of the community. And uh, it's something that's important for our work uh, to do because we also get something back. And the same goes uh, for if someone asks me to do a smaller artist commission, um, if it's indeed a smaller NGO who really just want to promote their work, I know how beneficial it could be for them to have a good logo or to have, um, a nice illustration to go with one of their blog posts. So then I will either charge nothing or something very small, but if it's a larger private company indeed, or a, a private person saying, hey, I would like to have a portrait for my house. Um, even um, for example, one of the scientists uh, that I illustrated, uh, she said, oh, I would like a matching portrait for my husband um also blended with his research then i do charge a little bit because it's something um that i know they can afford and uh so it, just like natalia i make it very much dependent on who is asking but i would also like to note that valuing my own work uh, work valuing my time is something i'm still learning especially as an artist so uh it's something that I feel um, I'm definitely not the definitive person to ask on, especially if you ask my partner. I always undervalue my uh, my artwork, and it's something that I'm still definitely learning to do. And I think it comes with time and experience. Oh, so I guess acknowledging there's a worth to your work, but I also realize that um, a lot of that kind of, I suppose, paralyzed and you in terms of where you want to charge it and how you draw those boundaries. Um, 
Imposter uh, syndrome, I think, is a key word here. It's everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, if I were a scientist trying to approach uh, you both, then I suppose there needs to be some level of self awareness of being like, if I'm working for a large vacation company or something, or a large funded project, um, it's probably a little cheeky to start asking for perhaps free labor versus parts of more of a charity base then. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, when it comes down to that kind of engagement between scientists and artists and obviously science artists, um, I just want to pick up on a question about, uh, you actually, I think just answered Natalia, but I just wanted to bring it out into the forum about um, illustrating for other scientists. Um, how do you start, um, I suppose if you're from a less academic background or from an area that's um, not really the um, not area of expertise, how do you engage with those spaces? So if you're an artist and you're trying to illustrate for another field, um, how is the best way to approach that? Perhaps uh, there's another area of paper. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I, I guess it starts from knowing your own strengths and weaknesses. Know what you can easily draw and things you cannot really draw easily. So I remember I was asked to be uh, to draw crinoids uh, and parasitism. I mean, I don't know how to draw a crinoid. I know don't know how to write a uh, illustrate a parasitic snail. I might learn it, but it will be a steep learning curve, and I will spend more time on this artwork than somebody that is an expert in invertebrates. So in this kind of thing, I might just say to a commissioner, "I will give a quick shot at making a sketch. I give show you a very quick sample. If you enjoy it, I can take it." Over, but I recommend other artists you can look uh, forward to. So it's always good to have some kind of backup artist. If somebody reaches out to you and my, you might feel like, oh, I'm too busy for this, that's a too steep uh, learning curve for me. It's not art style uh, that I can, I'm comfortable with and put them into some uh, different position. For me, I'm slightly more comfortable drawing uh, like uh, theropods uh, and pterosaurs. So I'll happily work in that field, but also happily stretch myself out if I have time uh, and will to do it. Uh, and the commissioner is happy with me uh, sort of experimenting, but that comes with the kind of cause because I have no idea. I might accept an illustration of uh, a basal horse, but I have no idea if I'll be happy when it comes out. And the worst thing is you might create the illustration and you might completely hate it. And then you feel bad for charging anything for it. Uh, and it's just the guilt gets into you and you don't want to engage with anything, which happened each time I do a commission to, for someone else. Uh, and it makes it very, very hard for me to accept commissions from other people, especially for research that I not, might not be completely an expert in. And sort of that limits my scope. But also like, I want to be true to myself. I want to know my different strengths and weaknesses, but it's very hard to be self judged especially in art. It's very hard to be self judgmental on your art and see that that's a good quality artwork. That's a bad quality artwork. It's very hard to tell you hate everything. <laughs> that's the worst thing about it. <laughs> I assume, like, I see, I see you nodding, or is this? I assume you had similar mental hiccups. Absolutely, and um, I think one of the key points that you mentioned here is to really know your own strengths and weaknesses. For example, if anyone asked me to um, illustrate a pterodactyl, I would refer them to you and say, "Okay, this is a much, much better choice of artist than I am." But, and then again, when, if someone came to you maybe with the request for a watercolor glacier, you might say, well, <laughs> perhaps not my area of expertise, but I know someone else. So I think it's very important uh, also to be open and honest with your client when they uh, come to you with a request, um, they might not know who else is out there. So uh, I think that it's important to be honest and say, okay, I appreciate you requesting this from me, but if you want the best uh, possible uh, outcome for what you're looking uh, for your project, you might want to ask someone else. So again, there, the networking aspect is really important. And sometimes you're just the science artist that one person knows. And through your network, you might be able to refer them uh, to someone else. Honestly, I wish there was some kind of big archive of different artists with different art styles and professions. So it would be much simpler for somebody to search rather than just yes. go for one and then have a whisper network of leading you to the right person. Because there's so many artists and they all want to have some work and they're excellent people, but they might want out of, out of radar because they might not be in academia. They might be in a different country. So it would be sort of great as a resource to have like a 
phone book of different artists and different uh, small portfolios. So people say like, I want to have what are called glacials. Here are the artists that do it, and I pick the style I like. And yeah. they are available. This kind of thing it would be super useful. Definitely, but I think for now the best we have is social media, mm -hmm. and um, and knowing other people and just yeah. being friendly. Like I know somebody that needs this kind of work. I'm currently busy. I recommend this. I usually like recommending small artists, which are still yeah. de developing themselves, usually from developing countries or something like a small commission can really boost them uh, uh, and the confidence and uh, platform them. So it's sometimes being an established artist very good to just look at people that are few levels below you and it's like. I know how to help this person. I'm too busy to do this commission, but I can forward you to those people which might really benefit from the same thing. Exactly. Sure. So I guess the key takeaways there is um, be aware of your own capabilities and the community around you. Um, who can refer one to do a, um, a work in your stead. But also, if you are unsure, it feels like something you could engage in. I suppose to do like a, a test or a mock-up and do an expectations management with your potential client in terms yeah. of what you can do. Communication with the yeah. client is key. Yeah. And also, of course, be aware of those self-doubt and judgment that comes along with every bit of passion project. Yeah. Um, so you spoke about networks, actually. I think that's a good next step to go on to. Um, if you're a scientist looking for um, artists or perhaps a science artist trying to build up your presence or portfolio. Um, is that a best way to do it? You said social media, I guess that's pretty one of the key vectors for both scientists and artists. It's, that's how I uh, find most of my science artists actually. So I guess, uh, do you have any those thoughts about how to build up a network or portfolio in that case? I think social media really is uh, key here because if you have, if you make some work that people like, and they might share it. Uh, that is how others find you. Um, also, the companies that I do commissions for, um, I think 95% of people either find me via Instagram or Twitter. Um, especially, there's a lot of company, companies now who sell my artwork as prints, and that allows me to make passive income, which is just, I would have never had that opportunity had they not found me uh, via Instagram. And then I think the second thing is, especially if you're a scientist looking, um, EGU uh, really is a great resource because what you can see is uh, you can have a look at the talks that were given at the past EGU GAs and uh, have a look at the science communication sessions, have a look at the abstracts uh, that were uh, the abstracts for presentations in the um, science communication, in the art sessions. Um, if you want to find um, poetry, have a look at, oh, who was the co-convener for the Rhyme research? And these are the people that you might want to connect with, or these are at least the people you know, oh, they might have a network. The conveners for the art and science session they might be the people who are able to refer you. So I think uh, EGU um, in this term really might be an under a, a completely overlooked resource uh, in terms of networking. Uh, also, when you are something in a specialized as paleontology, there's a lot of paleo artists already, and they have the network links via Discord channels and social media like Twitter. You also can do it in person. In, uh, in person, it's slightly different because you get to meet person, you make uh, leave a lasting impression on them, and a lot of conferences are allowed some kind of display area. So you can have ask for a small display of your own artwork, uh, have small uh, contact details if somebody's interested, and you have people that you know will be within your research area. So for example, a glacial artist will not fit in a palatable setting, but if I have all paleontologists and paleo artists, they'll go, oh, I need an artist that specializes in, uh, I don't know, rodents. Here's an artist that can do rodents. I'm going to get uh, business cards if I need them. I'm going to get in touch. So having a physical presence and going to conferences in person is also very important. And that's how I got some commissions. And I know how other people, especially that are really established, go for. So they usually find themselves uh, it's slightly more pricey, especially when you're outside of uh, paleontology. You have to look out of your comfort zone and pay for arrivals and setting up stalls and prints. There's a startup cost associated with it. And not people, and a lot of people have this luxury of 
I can easily print a batch of prints. I can get to a, a conference in the United States or somewhere in the US, uh, UK for Palantical Association or something and for advertise myself. So if you're a startup, start with social media because there's very minimal things you have to pay for. If you are starting to establish, already have all of uh, artworks you want to uh, showcase and really are dedicated to get, getting those customers, find a conference and ask if you can have a stall uh, and that will sell you, you can sell your prints over there and also get commissions and establish yourself as a big established name within the community for plantologists. But that's like the end line of your establishment. You can start with Twitter, Instagram, and see your following grow. If you are uh, friendly and your art is unique enough, you will definitely find people and people like uh, me and Larissa, I'm pretty sure we like boosting up uh, up and coming artists and uh, showcasing them because it's it's we are not in competition with another. Everybody draws differently. Uh, we have have very unique artistic voices, which is great in both art. That means nobody's stepping on each other's shoes, and the more voices we have, the better because that means we have we can communicate science in very different colors and ways. Excellent. Thanks both. We're quickly coming towards the end, uh, but I'll just time for one question. Uh, I will also just thank Larissa for the plug about the European Geosciences Union. We do have a general assembly every year in which thousands of scientists and science artists attend. We have resident artists. We have sessions dedicated to communicating science through art. So if you do want to find other artists, be on social media, uh, look at the European Geoscience General Assemblies. Uh, there's a long history of uh, science artists engaging there. Um, I think that's pretty much it for questions. We have to wrap it up soon. Uh, I do have one audience question left um, about how do you balance kind of protecting and copywriting your artwork versus advertising on social media? If anyone's got anything, they can comment on that at all. Yeah, it's, it's I'm not going to lie, it's difficult. Um, Sometimes uh, people will use your artwork pretending they made it. Um, I have had people contact me um, later with regrets. That was actually one of the most interesting situations where people had gotten my artwork tattooed on them and then later realized that that was not a great thing to do. Um, people will print t-shirts or notebooks with your artwork and sell them. And um, I at some point have people selling notebooks with my artwork on it on Amazon. And then the only thing you can do is contact Amazon or contact the platform, have them take it down. But I think it's just a risk. It's a risk you run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to decide, do you want to be apparent on social media and get those jobs and put your artwork on, or just be transparent and not risk your artwork being stolen? Especially a new problem is with the AI art, of uh, people just using your art to train algorithms and then replicating your artwork, technically copyright free, which happened a lot to some of my pantology friends with the artworks being used without the uh, agreement and replicated uh, on different fields. So it's a very, very tricky thing. I usually, when I put them on social media, I make them very low quality. Uh, it hurts uh, sometimes for people viewing, viewing them, but it prevents uh, replication. So if somebody wants to yeah. print it on thing, it will be just too low quality to do anything. Some people have very big uh, water watermarks on your artwork, but that so sometimes destroys how it looks visually and might, you know, make your artwork look less appealing, but it will prevent stealing. So uh, I would recommend if you post on social media, make it look to look nice would be slightly pixelated if anybody wants to steal it it jewel will look horrible and will not be of use on printing on the larger scale if somebody wants to take it seriously and use it usefully you have high definition versions that sent to that person if they're required uh, so it's a risk worth the, i think it's a risk worth taking but don't get disheartened if you see somebody stealing your artwork or using a recitation it just happens to all of us uh, and you can legally block them. You, if you are creator of your artwork, if you can prove it, you, in, at least in the UK law, you are the creator of it, you own the artwork rights, if you can prove you made it, uh, and then remove anybody commercially using it without your approval. But that might take some back, backdoor channels, depending where your artwork is being replicated. Sometimes it's just things stealing artworks via algorithm. So basically, there's, uh, somebody says, oh, I love this design. I love it on a t-shirt. And there's an app that yep. looks at that keyword. 
and it copies the artwork and alternately creates a t-shirt on a website somewhere in uh, a developing country with slightly different copyright laws. So uh, it happens, be, don't tell your followers to not say things like, I will love this as a sticker, I will love this as a shirt, because algorithm thinks, features think, things kind of and just make artificially made uh, products they can be selling. So be aware of that, which is horrible, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that uh, AI art might be a whole new webinar or session in itself at some point. But um, yeah, so I guess basically you need to build a community and network as you're trying to become an artist or, um, but as you do so, uh, be aware of the, what the content you're sharing. So perhaps reduce the resolution, use watermarks, try and be aware of the copyright laws of the country you're in. Um, and also if you are building a community, that's also how you might be able to become aware of when your art's been used or misused. Um, and also how you might be able to find ways to kind of counteract that as well. Um, we're gonna have to wrap up the webinar now. It's coming close to one hour. Um, I'd like to thank both our speakers, Larissa and Natalia, for uh, doing such a passionate and engaging webinar. Um, the recording of this webinar will be on our YouTube channel in one week's time. That is at Eurogeosciences on YouTube. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to thank again both our speakers and for attendees and question answers. Uh, so thank you and uh, goodbye.